Welcome to Waiting on the Trade, a comics book club for people who can't keep up with monthly comics. I'm Matt Ledger. I'm Patrick Fitzgerald Fleck. And I'm Catherine Prince. This month, we're talking about A Guest in the House, the most recent graphic novel from horror cartoonist extraordinaire Emily Carroll. Now, in case you need a refresher, A Guest in the House is the story of Abby, a woman who has recently married a dentist named David and become a stepmother to David's daughter, Crystal. As Abby adapts to her new life, she strikes up a surprising connection with David's first wife, Sheila. But at story's end, we find out Abby's connection to Sheila, and much of what we've seen on the page may not be what it seems. Hard one to sum up succinctly, (laughs) guys. (laughs) Did you write that? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. I thought maybe you got it from the cover. No, I I write all the synopses myself because sometimes I make snarky remarks in them. Not this time though. There was too much actual work to do. <laughs> yeah, I was just like dancing around all the I guess this is one wherein spoilers will occur. Oh, I mean they all are spoilers. Yeah. Are I mean this one especially though, if it's just like uh I'm halfway through it situation, then read the ending first. Yeah. yeah. Back out. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not too late. Kat spent her couple hours post-work, pre-podcast recording, hunting for clues today to piece together how the ending all fits together. So I'm excited to talk about this one. But Catherine, welcome back to the podcast. Glad to have you as Thank always. Thank you. I am stoked to finally be talking about an Emily Carroll with, book with you and Patrick on the podcast because I feel like you and I, Kat, talk about Emily Carroll stuff like decently often, actually. Yeah, kind of surprisingly frequently. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, And I think, like, you tell me if I'm wrong on this, but, like, probably one of your favorite cartoonists slash storytellers slash artists. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I guess, yeah. Why is that so? I was just thinking about the storytellers part, because it's like, oh, wow, that includes all of fiction, and, like, suddenly the field gets way bigger. Oh, yeah, and movies, blah. But, um... Yeah, Emily Carroll just has really interesting mixes of, um, well, A, an incredible grasp of color and flow in comics. And um, I gave you guys a couple of my favorite of her web comics to to really see her flex in, um, because I think the web medium is more, like, it gives you more that you can do with it than you can in a book and she takes like full advantage of that and it's really cool um without resorting to like literal jump scares which like Um, a quick diversion on that actually the two you had us read which were the prince and the sea and hotel oh you know the name of it hotel something uh, or other oh shoot i don't have it up in front of me but yeah they're just on her website the the Welling- <sighs> Wellington maybe I'm oh pulling up the Oh my god, the Worthington, the Worthington, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You sent us those two. I really like both those two, and they do really neat stuff. You didn't send us the one where the ads on the page literally become like horror ads in the middle of the. Comic, <gasps> I didn't remember that that happened. Which is like one of the coolest goddamn things. Oh I've yeah, ever seen in a web comic. the spam pop ups on the sides. Like she has, like they look real, and then you get to the end and they start getting really freaky. Yeah, so oh, they I look forgot like about that ads. one. Which one is they that? Like, I don't remember which one it is, but like Shoot. they look like real ads on a web page, Pat. And like as you're reading the comic, they become just like part of the horror story. Like they become like scary ads. <laughs> like mm. oh, it's such a great use of web comics. Oh, yeah, like I could have, I could have done more, but I was like, oh, I was just pick my favorites. Like I really like mermaids, and I think the like what is it, the salophobia or something. The fear of the deep is really cool. So I like the prince in the the sea. Um, like that's probably my favorite thing that she's done actually, just cause I like mermaids, um, especially spooky ones. And I think the Worthington was just like a really cool example of how it doesn't have to be a narrative to be a good web comic. Yeah, the but yeah, there's, like oh, there's so many other ones. So digression aside for the moment, what made you want to talk about this book specifically for the podcast, The Guest in the House? Well, it is... I mean, on the one hand, it is a timely book that just came out. So it's um, something that you'll see in bookstores right now, probably. But also, like, what the hell is going on with the ending is I just needed someone (laughs) to figure that out with. 
So I read through it when I got it for, I think, what, Christmas? And then I just read uh, through that it. That was your birthday, actually. I my believe. birthday, yeah. <laughs> um, same thing. And then, <laughs> and then, again, just like looking for clues to try to figure out what's going on. And I have like a whole list of weird clues that kind of look like, you know, when you a crazy person just like writes a bunch of stuff on the walls and you look and you're like, what is all this? <laughs> this a, is what my notebook board. page it's looks a like. Technical term. Yeah, it's kind of a murder board. Well, without any of the string. <laughs> yeah, no but, strings. Um, yeah, I d- d- in this I've economy, got a bunch of clues. I don't know what they mean. We don't have time for strings. We got pen and paper. <laughs> no, I've got like so. I went through it yesterday because I knew you'd be going through it today, and I've got like six like half size notebook pages of notes. Also, just pulling together Jesus. different stuff because. I think we spent like an evening talking about the ending of this the first time both of us read it. Like you read it and then it took me a while to get to it. And then I think we were we were, like spent an evening trying to figure out what the heck was going on. Was it? I feel like there was so much time in between that I had forgotten some stuff and I was like, wait, which one's Abby? Who's she? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, so it'd be good to like, those. it is fresh. Pat's fresh, fresh takes. Hot takes. Fresh yeah, hot takes. Yeah. Pat's got Pat's got stuff pulled in. I've, I'm seeing screenshots and screenshots. Oh and yeah, screenshots Pat came right in, in the recording channel, so I'm pumped. Let's talk. And about these screenshots are what also that's what also appears in my notes for some of them. I should have thought of doing screenshots. <laughs> that would make a lot more sense. So yeah, we may have similar things to say. It looks Psyched. like we do for sure. Mm. Pat, how did you generally find the book? Yeah, I enjoyed it. Horror is not really my go-to. But yeah, I appreciated it. So I like that this is more of, and like most Emily Carroll stuff is more of like a creepy, unsettling, slow burn, ambiguous horror as mm-hmm. opposed to like. I would, character, I would contest character. that. I think most of her stuff isn't ambiguous. There's a, there's a couple that are, but I think most of it is more almost like a fable sort of yeah setup. Ambiguous might not actually be the right word i might be thinking of like my thoughts on the ending and transposing that word in but i'm thinking of like the part in through the woods where like um the little red riding hood stand in is like walking through the forest and the forest is like just looks like a normal forest but also it's got like these weird like half images of wolves all through it if you were like look carefully like that sort of thing where it's like it's not like the story is directly attacking you in the way that like we were talking about those um, Korean web comics where you just scroll down the page and then it's like, ah! I didn't yeah. actually mention that that was a Korean web comic thing, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My students showed me so many of those. <laughs> we taught English in Korea. Yeah. Like it's not that sort of thing. It's more of like a, like a feeling of dread, like ambiguous fantasy horror than like a, a direct attack you in the face sort of horror. Mm-hmm. There's a buildup, and there's definitely a lot of sapphic imagery um, in a lot of her stuff. Yeah, for sure. So I made us not do discussion questions for this one, which I feel like puts it on me to to drive the discussion a little bit. But like, I didn't want to, especially recently. I feel like we've like been a little limited by the discussion questions. Like, I felt like we've gone off on a track, and it felt like it didn't quite fit, and we didn't quite get the conversation to go where it wanted to. So, so now we have murder it. boards instead. <laughs> Especially for the murder boards. Well, that's the thing. It's like I knew we were going to have murder boards, and I didn't want to get into it with like, oh, we have three specific questions, and we're going to discuss them, and then like we're we're going to peel off into like like digressions and like putting clues together, and like, does this photo look the same on this page as on this page? Which cat I disagree about. So Pat, you can solve an argument for us. Jesus, Pat, your screenshot. I just found the the others you posted. Like these are all things that yeah. uh, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so i think maybe we can start with actually high level like do you guys feel like there's a theme to this book because when i was going through it yesterday i feel like i pulled out what i think is the theme of the book oh and yeah there's definitely a theme okay never so marry the- a dentist <laughs> dentist not even don't once. do it oh my god so like he there's a scene where david says being with you makes me feel like i can be who i truly am and i'm like wow dude that means you're a big old dick is who you truly are because like you just it's such a weird it's such a weird <laughs> marriage i'm so glad i get to be a big old dick with you honey <laughs> <You're an> asshole <laughs> when he mixes up abby's name and crystal's name when he's talking oh, about the parent teacher conference thing it's like um a little weird spooky. 
And I, I was saying to Kat, though, it's not like anyone ever transposes any of our names. <laughs> I mean, just sure. the fact that he was equating their names is a little bit creepy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and like, if oh, you really? want to give somebody serial killer vibes, just give them the those, glasses? like, yeah, those 1980s style glasses where you can't mm. see their eyes. Ugh. But backing up a minute, what did you guys, did you guys actually pull out like a theme to this book at all? Like a high level theme or? My theme wasn't good theme? enough. Okay. <laughs> no, um. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We solved it. Podcast over. <laughs> <laughs> the whole book was actually just a secret code. <laughs> that says, Don't marry a oh, what's uh, your pets first? I mean, uh, the whole thing is sort of the the toxic relationship that Abby has with her perceived, like what she perceives to be the perfect feminine, like picture of what it means to be feminine is what's is what I interpret as what has driven her oh. to this. It's definitely so part I, of it. That's I guess that's what I'm like. I think it's her struggling with the fact that she doesn't match up to what she considers to be a perfect feminine form. And I think it's also her struggling with her sexuality. I think it comes in there too. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Like there's so a couple things on that, actually. One of them ties in with one of the images you've screenshotted and put in front of me here. Like when she goes to get a haircut from the other dentist wife who is not named. And Wait, that dude's a dentist? They're all dentists. Yeah, I think they're, they're all, all theoretically de- dentists. Oh my no, God. They might also be counterfeiters. We should talk uh, about that when we get to I it. I missed some clues. <laughs> Um, when she goes to get a haircut from the other dentist's wife, who is specifically not named, she's specifically called other dentist's wife, even by Abby in the text, which is again, like very telling to me about like where women are. I thought she gave her a name. She, I don't think so. I specifically wrote down his wife. It's on my fourth page here somewhere. Brad. My short name is Brad. Complicated. (laughs) Mr. Brad's wife. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just Brad. Um, but she is just Brad. Um, she gets the same haircut as Beth slash Sheila. Like she gets the same haircut that Beth had when she came to her house. Cause she, like, she wants to be that perfect wife that she thinks Beth is, even though they've only met for like two seconds. <laughs> so like, you're definitely, you're definitely onto something there, Pat, with like, she's trying to find this form, right? Like she talks about how becoming a wife gets, gives her a shape in that like, yeah the very cool creepy panel where she's going from an amorphous blob into a spiky. Knife. Well, yeah. She, she now know like she can't, the urges that she may feel when she sees a beautiful woman, she can't act on it anymore because she's married. She can't do that anymore. So she has yep. the excuse to ignore it. Yep. I am wife now. And yeah. like when she's discussing her marriage right away too, like you notice that the first thing she talks about and that she likes is like the concept Making of coffee. being married. Like, I'm a wife, I'm pouring the coffee, blah, blah, blah. My stepdaughter, I might love her. I kind of like my husband. Like, she doesn't like the people she's entered into a relationship with. She likes being married. She likes everything having its place. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, like, the line about the nooks and crannies in the house is very telling to me. Like, that's very symbolic to me. This felt very, like, college English class to me, picking this thing apart. I think it's very layered on purpose, which is kind of nice. I think it's kind of about depression. Like she's yeah. very obviously depressed. She just doesn't have any joy that she takes out of her life. Her only things that she likes are the the color pages that are like the stories and the imagination and this ghost that may or may not be real. And like, like everything that that's interesting in her stuff, life right? is made like, up. Yeah. 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 Like So it's so just like it's all this story. isolation. She had a, like a shitty mom, her sister died. She's mm-hmm. in this like just kind of numbing marriage it's just i guess a whole other layer of horror that isn't horror well i mean yeah. it's not like you know spooky ah horror but just existential dread yeah, sort of it's thing not horror, it's real life horror it's like oh i'm stuck in this thing that i don't want to be in and i don't really know how to, i don't know how to get out and also i feel like i have to conform to it like not only do i not want to get out i wish i didn't feel this way mm-hmm. Neither of those is the thing that I was thinking about. Though. What's your thing? So, I, like, so much of the book to me is about how you can't 
truly know another person, like even yourself. And I feel like that, like those disconnects are how the ending kind of sneaks up on you too, of like, oh, this is what's actually been happening the whole time. But like, because we're seeing everything through Abby's head and Abby's imaginings are so fantastical all the time. And like, I don't even know that there's a ghost in this story, you guys. Like, I don't think there's a real ghost at all. We yeah, talk about I feel that like it's kind of like a, a Kafka, the metamorphosis thing where some people are like, oh yeah, it's a it's an allegory for stuff and he's having a psychotic break. And other people are like, he's, just, he's a bug. What do you mean? He's a bug. I mean, I think it's, it's like that either way and could be either and that's kind of cool although i'm just gonna say yeah i'm in the he's a bug camp of um the metamorphosis and i'm in the there is a ghost camp of this all right you think there is one interesting Mm -hmm. i want to talk specifically about the drowning scene then for sure but before i get into (laughs) before we get into that um like so much of the book is Abby project. Like, so Kat, you and I talked about this, I think earlier, like Abby talks to Crystal about her mom showing up and Crystal says nothing about a ghost until prompted. Yeah. She's like, I guess it's a ghost. No. She's like, My mom showed up. She looks different. She came out of the water. Which like- is also kind of weird though, that this like, this lady, this middle-aged lady is just like swimming up to the dock from like, next door. She's like, she's she is living in that house that no one lives in. Like it's an abandoned house. She's just living there and she's swimming across the lake to go into their house and like visit their daughter. And one, at one next- point, David's like, how did this mug get on the dock? Sheila took it out of their house and was drinking from it on the dock before she swam back to the other house. Wait, really? I thought Abby I, just had it out there. I don't oh. think so. That's my oh, theory sheesh. at least. Oh, you think you think Sheila was literally visiting Crystal? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. She's like, she looks different. Well, yeah, she does look different. She looks way the fuck different from the last time Crystal saw yeah, her. Yeah, I mean, like, when she when she sees Abby in the car and she's like, where are you going? She's like, I'm going into town to get my roots dyed. So she, that lady dye in her hair. And oh, you yeah, just assume it's because she's, like, older. Yeah, so there's that disconnect. There's the disconnect where, so, like, getting into the part about David eventually drowning slash being drowned, like he, he and Abby are talking about like why he doesn't like water. And she's like, can you swim? And he just basically tells her like, I'm just, you know, there's bodies in there. And like, that dude can't swim. Like he just doesn't tell her that. And like, he doesn't want her to know the truth about that. Cause that would make him like less manly. And so in that scene where like, according to what we see on the page, the ghost is helping drown him. Like, I'm pretty sure that dude just can't swim. He was drunk and fell in the water. <laughs> and then his wife drowned him. It was real easy because he was drunk and can't swim. Maybe. Yeah, the yeah, bodies thing was kind of weird because he was like, I don't want Crystal to go in that body of water. But she can swim in this one, which also is like, you know, if that dude did like... Well, no, because he wouldn't have killed his wife there because they didn't kill his wife. His country. wife shows up at the end. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. I think we can all agree that Sheila is the weird lady that keeps popping in and not the ghost. The ghost is not Sheila. The ghost is something else. I mean, I think the ghost is just Abby's imaginings of what she wants. I'm not sure that's true. And I like mean, that, she's seen the ghost in. My theme of like, she sees all these weird, like, she sees this picture of Sheila. She remembers that picture differently later on, which this is the argument Kat and I have. Of uh, like, no. <laughs> the, it's look, really, dude, women have curves, and in different poses, we look slightly different. It's not. That's not it. It's the same photo remembered differently. It's like showing the fallibility. Yeah, it's showing of her face. Yeah, it's the same photo, and it's got her in a completely different pose where her entire face appears, and she's prettier. Like, No, she's not prettier. You were saying she, like, gained seven pounds or something, and I was no, like, what? She's skinnier in the no, second she's version not. of the photo, and you no, can see her not. entire face when you can't see it in the one that Pat has posted in the recording chat here. The face? Yes, absolutely. The, like, seven pounds of difference? No. I, I can She is that. more shapely. Ah, uh, uh, uh-huh. are you looking are you at the about, right word? I the right word. The I right don't know. Word, the right page. <laughs> I honestly don't know. When she appears in Abby's imagination in the tower that she rec- rescues her from. Okay, you know what she looks like in that tower, though. This is my my theory: is that Abby kind of, sort of has a crush on her older sister. Yeah, I think like, she saw no, her older sister as the perfect woman. As this is what a 
an attractive, beautiful woman looks like. Yeah. And that's the image that she's now. Yeah, and like her older sister is the one who can like face like, down the old dragon, right? Like the the hair that that lady has in the tower, which Patch has put in the the chat here, is mm -hmm. her sister's hair. It's got those like curls. It's not because Lisa's in the picture is straight. But it's Sheila's shirt, so like she's misremembering stuff. She's conflating stuff. Like she's making this idealized version of this person that is n neither of the two people that she's. She's slightly. To. She's slightly thinner than Sheila's photograph that she finds. Yeah, in crystals. and the same thing happens later when Abby remembers what the photo of Sheila is supposed to look like. She puts her entire beautiful face in there, and she makes her this skinny as opposed to. She's what she not actually looks like. fat in the first one. We're not that. saying she's, she's fat. fat. She's We're wearing not. a crop top. You you just see more of her. We are absolutely Cat, not if you, calling if her you, fat. No one's saying fat, but if you compare the lines in the photo or the image that Pat just it's, put in It's fat, a more you know, conventional looking beauty there. than it's, it's different. I got it. Where's the page with the original photo? I posted it up above. Oh. Uh, oh. No, that's the end one. No, that's Sheila the one. at the game is the one that's her taking the photo underneath. Oh, I Crystal's thought the one photo. you just put. Okay, no. wait. Well, that's the imagined in. picture. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there she is. Okay. She's just ever so... She's not fat. She's just... No, no one's saying fat. Hmm. Actually, yeah, you might be right. Thank you. <laughs> huh. Okay, so it's possible, though, that Abby is haunted, and the ghost is just whatever she wants to see. That's how she sees it. Because... And this is something um, Pat put in the chat also with the images, which I guess I'll here. stop alluding to that because oh, <laughs> no God, one else can see the chat. The entire chat. Uh, but okay. <laughs> some of so she mentions the she had she had an imaginary friend named Lady Grey, mm. who okay, can I just do a diversion? Lady Grey is only pictured once, and she yep. is in this like splendid Rococo 18th century gown, which is I think one of the things Emily Carroll draws best. And she's got a slit throat, um, yes. which weirdly which I really do want to the, talk about. What yeah, and the ghost will have that later. But like, oh my God, look at the sleeves on this dress. Like the actual way that those sleeves were constructed is that they're pleated and not gathered, which you can see here. Yeah, I mean, like the amount of, I mean, even for the armor too, like the armor, as much as it's like hyper exaggerated to make a point, haha <laughs> pun, um, like is also very well put together and I feel like probably well researched also like the book looks good in so many different ways <laughs> little details they add up yeah but Pat you said you wanted to talk about a slit throat yeah so like I was talking about uh, Abby's imaginary friend when she was younger that comforted her has a slit throat and we see that image used again when the ghost of Sheila or the imagination of what the ghost of Sheila has uh, a, a wound that she's bleeding onto uh, Abby. One of the first images we see of Abby is her looking at herself in the mirror and then she plunges her hand into her throat. Yeah. The, the page also, that made you be like, I'm intrigued by this. <laughs> hmm, something's happening here. Yeah. And then there's the, the opening where she t says she dreams of, of dragons and she defeats the dragon presumably cutting its throat and we get an Cutting image open, of her yeah. standing in the gore with all the blood and, and gems dripping from it. So what's up with that? <laughs> what do you guys think <laughs> of the wait where she kills the dragon in the beginning? Well, they're all seem to be imagery of wounds in the throat or nearby. And then either Abby like bathing in it or like, She's kind of even being like nourished by it a little bit. In the, something. In the, the Sheila ghost one or whatever. Whoever's ghost we've decided that is. <laughs> I mean, I guess when people are like fantasizing about suicide, low key, maybe they'll just do it over and over again the same way. I'm also thinking like, we know that her mom is dead. We do not know how the, when, um, dentist man, what's his name? Neil. David. David comes back. Um, the night that he drowns, mm -hmm. he's like, oh, your mom was always like passing out in the bathtub. So I'm wondering, like, maybe her mom died in the bathtub and like killed herself there. And that's why she's conflating some stuff. Maybe. 
Maybe. But it's it's a strained, it's a repeated imagery that Abby has. And yeah. The dragon we're thinking is her interpretation of her mother. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Because her like her the, sister the refers to her as the old dragon. We get a, a glimpse of her seated in a chair with a cigarette. But she becomes the dragon eventually. There's a part where like her her um armor kind of warps when she's wearing yeah. it. You can see it's got dragon jaws. And well, so yeah. I read that as like kind of the the number her mother has done on her, right? Like all of us are shaped by our parents in some way, shape, or form. So like there's some amount of her mother in there. Like so much like her mother clearly like did not approve of her sexual identity. I feel like she did. Whoa, know I don't know about clearly. I don't think she even realizes that she has uh feelings for other women until I mean, even if she didn't explicitly not approve, like some like something there abby is like this is not okay because my mom thinks it's not okay i don't know if it's like an explicit like talk they had or it's just something that like she just de- like decided as a child from how her mom acts or what like but... page 191 by the way for which for the the um oh, i guess this won't help you matt for the no. armor just sort of morphs into a dragon yeah, I mean, like, and I so, guess like that's the weird star eye kind of moves around too. Like the dragon used to have it, and then she has it by the end. Yeah. So what I actually thought you were talking about was the like, I guess it's like fourth to last page or whatever, where you see the image of the the like ghost that is kind of Sheila, kind of her sister, her like image of herself as the knight in the armor with that like weird dragon tail tongue. Like that's what I thought you were talking about. And then the hag and then the dragon. And like that page to me was very much like showing that all of these weird imaginings that Abby has of this fantastical world, like are actually all part of her, like that she hasn't dealt with completely. And like, she's externalized in this, these weird ways. Like, like she's, she's the beautiful princess. She's the knight. She's the hag. She's the dragon. Like, and they're all just like, Oh, that's interesting. I read them as like, Ghost Abby, Ghost Abby, and the eyes getting bigger for the Abby one. Yeah, which I mean, like, part of the cool part of this book is I think there's different interpretations to be had for sure. But, like, it just kind of struck me reading through it yesterday that 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 seemed like the best one to me. And it plays into my theme of, like, not, like, you only know other people so well. And, like, you even only know yourself so well. Like, Abby's doing this to herself and I think doesn't even realize it, kind of. And, like, doesn't understand that all these pieces are part of her and how they're all interconnected. So... Okay, Pat, why is there a picture of the weird nest of colored pencils and um that's papers? the yeah, so that's the only evidence that I have that it might be a ghost. That was the only thing that I felt couldn't be explained away. Like why is she finding a nest of torn up pages and oh. broken pencils? I mean well, Crystal just, doesn't really stuff, feel right? like doing art anymore after that, so maybe she's just like, I'm done with this. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's very clearly a picture of once again the way that Abby pictures Sheila because it's how she's always being drawn with the blood crying eyes and the long blonde hair. Yeah. Yeah, the the, the blood crying eyes are weird. <laughs> like I don't know how those factor in. She's still dripping I mean, wet from, uh, from swimming over. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, also she doesn't have blonde hair, does she? She does. No. Sheila has blonde hair. Not well, not actual the Sheila. Moment. Yeah, she does. She gets her roots touched up so that it's brown. Oh, she's she living in disguise. In hmm. Yeah, but mm-hmm. okay. I mean, I don't know why it would be blonde, and, unless like she can't see her mom. I mean, she only sees her at night, right? And like no lights and stuff. So maybe she just thinks it's I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> that's my take. That's, at least that's weird. It's art. This weird. <laughs> so who do you think might be the counterfeiters of the like low key subplot of counterfeit bills? I what are you guys talking guy, about? I think possibly Wait, really? the dentist might be. I don't know. I'm not sure. If are you talking about, about what? the grocery store dealing with counterfeit money? Yeah, yeah. The reason that Abby goes home early is because her boss is like, oh, it was exciting by your place last night. Right. They found the counterfeiting ring. Well, it's in the house next to door. Her paycheck uh, anyway. That day, she was yeah. Go she. Home, she left early to go home because she was like, wait, what? What do you mean that this lady I've been talking to doesn't live in this abandoned house? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. 
Yeah, so, like, there's this counterfeiting thing that's been going on. And, like, the reason I think it's at least Mr. Brad, <laughs> and maybe all three of them, I don't know, is, like... Why would they, dentists need to do counterfeit money? Maybe they're not dentists. Well, I mean, one of them's at least a dentist. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they're dentists. Dentists would totally... Have you seen the... um? What's that thing with the Seymour the plant? Oh. Little Shop of Horrors? Yeah, yeah the <laughs> dentist in that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> really good, actually. Everyone told him he was going to be a dentist. Yeah, or that Matthew pain. Perry, Bruce Willis movie where the dentist is like, don't worry, I'll uh, do some dental work so that this body in the car is going to look like the body you want it to look like. Dentists are tricky, man. Dentists are shady. I just took it because there's that one scene where they're explaining the counterfeit uh, money problem to Abby at the store. And she like gives the the tray of of money like a look. I interpreted that as it's another instance of Abby like I'm a counterfeit. I'm pretending to be something that I am not. I, that's yeah, all I took from definitely. it. Is that Abby's just like oh well I oh, Abby I'm was fake. the counterfeiter the whole time. Well, I think that's just Abby just <laughs> once again looking down on herself because she's not. No matter how hard she's trying to fit in to be the perfect wife. She isn't, and it's starting her. She's starting to break. So this is an unessential piece of story, but this is kind of what I pieced together yesterday, like in my my own murder board <laughs> construction is like, so when David comes home drunk, he's talking about how Brad and Mrs. Brad were like, like arguing something about money or whatever. And like, then you find out late, like the next day that something had gone on with the counterfeiters and like, he's strangely home late when he's never home late. Like, so I feel like something like, oh. I feel like they were the counterfeiters and like, they were like on the lamb for the night. And like, that's why he was late again. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. It, like it doesn't yes. matter, but that's what makes sense to me. I thought he was just making too many mother-in-law jokes. But he says something about like, they've been arguing about money. <gasps> oh my gosh. Mm. So, and again, I mean, like, and David and, is a known liar. He's like, my wife uh, yeah, died from cancer. Herself. Wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you tell different people different things, man? Uh, um, what was I gonna say? Oh, so and that kind of like the reason that make that fits for me too is it kind of plays into my theme of like you only know people so well, right? Like her husband might be a counterfeiter and she didn't even know like all that, like the dentist might've been the counterfeiters and no one else knew, like just because they had this veneer of respectability or whatever. Like, so it's a possibility. I'm not a hundred percent on that one, but I, it makes sense in my, in my murder board connections. <laughs> okay. Can we talk about how the beautiful, like pregnant wife, Mrs. Brad also, when you guys read Brad, do you read it like Rocky horror picture? Brad. I wasn't because even I sure that was his real name, actually, still at this no, point. We just settled on that. So. Yeah, I'm so looking at the thing. She's Brad. like, oh, did you get enough to eat? And she's like, ha ha, bread. Anyway, can we talk about when Abby goes in to get her hair cut? This lady's like, oh, yeah, I believe in ghosts. I see a ghost all the time. It's just a creepy face. What is that? I don't know. I that one I didn't, hadn't figured out. A hairdresser talking during... Cutting hair? I don't know. People believe in ghosts. They, they like talking about them. believing in ghosts. Hmm. I thought maybe like, okay, well maybe there is a ghostness just hanging around looking for sad ladies to to give it some power or something. I don't know. So if there maybe. is a ghost, do you guys think it's a ghost of a specific person? Because I'm still, I think, on train there is no ghost. It's all in Abby's mind. But yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not like I said, the only evidence that I had were, was the torn up stuff underneath the thing. But yeah, it makes more sense that and Crystal just that. I think there could be a ghost out of the, hand. You guys are like, no, that's stupid. And so I, I have no evidence for ghosts anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you were like, it's inexplicable, and we were like, well, this is inexplicable. And then you explicked it, and we so explicked it. <laughs> yeah. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, what crashed through the the glass door when exactly was in the attic? that's inexplicable? Explic I mean, that away. A, a raccoon or something potentially. A raccoon big. making a lady shaped hole. Is it lady? I mean, the whole thought lady it's shaped. Not like, <laughs> yeah. It's not like a cartoon. She just Kool Aid man her way out of there. 
They do talk about bears a couple times, so it could have been a bear, I suppose. But uh, it does look like the glass is <laughs> from outside to see. inside. There's like scratches along the left side. Maybe so. I actually no, I think that's just glass. Was, oh, I actually was wondering if that was Sheila, but real Sheila coming like in the house. Now that oh, you mentioned maybe. the glass on the other side. But yeah, she just pulls on Michael Scott and runs right through the door. The glass is so something burst from inside the house out and lets them inside. Yeah, yeah it definitely was inside. You can see so, from the glass shards they painstakingly show. Yeah. Yeah. Raccoon. I don't know. While a raccoon was trapped in the there, house. Come on, man. You're trying too hard to explain it away. I mean, it could have been it could actually be other Sheila, like real Sheila. What's the what's the thing that Sherlock Holmes says? Like, when all other possibilities have been exhausted, what remains, however improbable, must be the truth. I feel like we haven't exhausted all other possibilities given how coon tripped in the house, house, huh? Um, Okay, here's an idea. Do you think (laughs) maybe Abigail is so out of it that she is talking to real Sheila at night? When she thinks she's talking to the Okay, well never mind. I mean, I I don't I'm think so. The it's possible. <laughs> yeah, convince me. I mean, it's the whole the whole conversation she has with Ghost Abby about my paintings are in the attic. He kept them, and so then she forces actually, her to go up to the attic attic and look. And then the ghost gets real upset with her when she finds out he sold or got rid of my paintings. And then it is literally Abby like getting pissed at her, freaking out, and then dashing like i'm trying to explain why there's a giant hole in their glass door and i think it might be abby just lost it like i don't know like not abby i'm sorry sheila is literally there talking to abby two things on that i guess one that's like one of my biggest pieces of evidence in my mind for the fact that there's not a ghost is the fact that the ghost was surprised about that Right. Like, why would the ghost be surprised about that if it was a real ghost? That's super weird. I think it's like Abby had decided in her mind that they were up there, and then when they weren't up there, her weird imaginings had to figure out why the ghost wouldn't know, and so the ghost got super pissed. That's point one. But point I mean, two. real Ab- or real Sheila wouldn't say he killed me when obviously he didn't kill her. I mean, maybe so. not. I don't know. That lady's not all there to, all there either. It doesn't seem like so. <laughs> but we can uh. talk about that when we get closer to the actually discussing the ending i guess so like <laughs> point two i really love that sequence where she goes up to the attic because i think the pacing is done really well and i think that's one of like two or three double page splashes in the book is that page yeah. where you like turn the page and then suddenly the attic is just huge and it's filled by the ghost sheila and the she's like full hag form and like cursing at abby and like calling her like a what a poor wife or something like that again i don't have it in front of me but like Pathetic bitch my murderers or yeah, yeah, my murder like just goes real hard like that. Like I think that sequence is paced so well and like again like coming from I read bullshit superhero comics and there's a double page splash like every other page cuz they think it's fun and they want to let artists sell art like using a double page splash like that impactfully is always very cool to me where it's like it's actually building to a moment and then the moment pays off as opposed to it's just kind of there. Like that was very cool. But I don't think it's real Sheila. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out figure what out, yeah. broke through the glass. Welcome to, welcome to the murder board, Pat. <laughs> you, I think I was texting you today and you were like, what clues? What are you What are you idiots trying to decipher? It's like, oh, you'll, you'll know when we get there. I guess I get now why there was a whole panel just showing the glass on the outside. Because I was like, oh, yeah, it's a ghost. But some people would be like, oh, somebody just threw a rock through the window. So that that had to be there to be like, no, it came from the inside. It's a, a bear sized hole, you guys. It could be a bear. It is not a bear sized <laughs> hole. I mean, maybe a baby be, bear. Yeah. A bear is like, I don't know, three Labrador retrievers, maybe. maybe but four. there doesn't seem to be anything else in the kitchen that's messed up. So I don't think it's, I think it is Sheila, like desperately trying to get out of the house because she was in the house. Yeah, it could be that too. Although, why she wouldn't just unlock? Why wouldn't she just use the door? <laughs> no, no. I Something just, just. I think it was the ghost. Okay, so here's my idea: is that it is a ghost, and it just changes because, like, 
she abby was saying after her sister died she used to see her standing in doorways and i, I think one of the spookiest scenes in here is where she first sees the ghost when that like ding-a-ling thing goes and it's exactly the same thing it's just like so that's another standing thing in the doorway for how it's not really sheila's ghost because it's the exact same like it's acting the exact same as what she thought yeah no but then like. i think she's being haunted by a ghost and her imagination just makes it like so that she can talk to the ghost because the ghost is all like it's been a long time since anyone saw me as a princess so it's probably like a weird ghost that makes people crazy i was gonna say do you think it's a specific ghost from like abby's life or do you think it's just a ghost like the ghost i think it's just a ghost you're like okay all right I also thought it was interesting when Crystal shows her the tale of Sir Gallypeg and she's all like, oh, I remember the ending. It was so sad. I cried. And Crystal's like, he doesn't die at the end. If you like look on page 104, I feel like that's kind of what it looks like. Establishing how unreliable a narrator Abby is, I well, think is what I filed that under. Well, it's also her imagining it. the book over and over again and it changing. So. She's having this like fantasy about hanging out with this girl with her shirt half unbuttoned under a tree, and then dragon steps on her. I bet that's what happens in her version of the story. Well, is Gally the dragon book. stepping on her, or is the girl turning into a dragon? No, it stepped on her. There's a dragon's foot there all of a sudden, and but there's no girl in those clothes. Yeah, so oh yeah, yeah, that's true. And there's a great big tongue. I don't know. So it's also weird, right? That like if the timeline is what Abby is pieced together as for the Sheila thing. Sheila either like has some sort of weird psychotic break and leaves and, or kills her. Well, I guess doesn't kill herself, but kill she herself. decides to tell people that she killed herself. So that thing yeah. happens. And then there's a fire. Maybe that's part of what happened. And then they move across the country. There was a bit when I was reading the book the first time where I was trying to decide whether the person who was saying she was Sheila was even Sheila. <laughs> but I decided that that's a stupid idea on the second read. <laughs> you think a crazy woman who wants to take the daughter? Yeah, who just wants a kid. Like, yeah, for a second I thought maybe, but like, I don't think that's... She I is a crazy person. I mean, she's like... Where did where was she living if it wasn't in that weird abandoned house? She definitely was, right? And she talks about how she's like... So again, the unreliability of people and like how they present themselves and like how they're seen by other people. A, while we're on this, sh like Abby, let's sh let's Beth go watch her kid. She's met this lady twice. Once was on the side of the road. <laughs> like what the hell? You're just let sending this woman to watch your kids because you think she's like this perfect suburb or like. I don't know. Like, yeah, because she's like, I don't bother asking how many kids she has. Everyone looks exactly the same, and they all have a bunch of kids, and they act the same. So wild. she's like, she's yeah, perfect, standard mom. Yeah. Clearly perfect. set in the, in the 90s. In Soccer mode. Before we've gotten into full stranger danger mode. Um, B, yeah. like, Sheila talks about how she's not a bad person, but she made some mistakes. And, like, when I hear someone say that, especially when they're, like, breaking into someone's house at the time, I'm like, well, that might be how you see it, but I'm curious to know like what other people's <laughs> interpretation of that those sentences would be. Like I don't know. Sheila seems like she's still got a lot going on. <laughs> it's interesting that she's like, Okay, so you killed my ex husband. I'ma let that slide. We're just gonna go. Well, they didn't like each other, so <laughs> Yeah. I guess in the in the moment you can't be like, Well, I'm I'm you're probably gonna get punished and I'm gonna tell people. I mean also she's like there and she thinks that abby could kill again probably too as we see by she picks up the knife pretty fast mm, yeah. yeah she also has her daughter upstairs that she's trying to yes. keep calm that's another question who do you think crystal is referring to when she runs and yells mom so that's a she's big made a point of, ending, of right? she's never called abby her mom yeah i think it also has to be sheila like especially when reading it because the person crying out initially when crystal says mom calls her chris and that's a thing that sheila does it's not a thing that abby does as far as i am aware i didn't notice it mm. so I, i'm pretty mm. sure she's calling out for her actual mom although it's definitely written in such a way to make you think about it because i definitely had the same thoughts on the first read and i was like who is she even calling for i think it's her actual mom i think it might be abby but that's okay that's fair. I mean, again, I think it's written to encourage both Ambiguous. I feel like they've connected enough. Yeah. 
I feel like the first time I read it, the the fact that Abby wasn't seeing the real ghost of Sheila was such a like wrench that I was just like, wait, what is happening for the ending? Yeah, it really but now, shows you, right? Yeah, but now like reading through it again, I'm like, okay, again, searching for clues, making my murder board. And when Sheila stops by and is like, what up? I live next door. My name definitely isn't Sheila. It's like these little things she does about the house. Like, hey, look at that uh, that lighthouse picture. That, that looked better in the front of the house. And like, <laughs> you idiot, why is this chime mounted on the wall? Put it on a door. Pretty sure that's for a door. <laughs> like, she's very forceful in a way that like, when you read it initially, it just reads as like typical, like, suburb mom like soccer mm -hmm. mom like forcefulness but i think when you read it the second time you can definitely read it as like she's super nervous she's in this house she doesn't want to be found out but she wants to be in there and get information so she's just like don't let the other like don't let the other person talk just rattle off stuff like just keep it moving <laughs> like so it's interesting to read it again for the second time for sure i read it more as like oh this is what you're doing with my stuff you're doing it wrong what do you mean you put a you put a jingle thing on a wall <laughs> like better outside come on <laughs> like that's used to be my jingle thing it was on the door okay so the last image of the comic let's just take a moment we go in there okay it. yeah <laughs> so, wait the, the two-page spread or the one where she's like i used to dream yeah no the very the very last image. i used to dream of no the two-page no, spread not the page black spread. page with in i used to dream of and the star yes and the star there's an art okay <laughs> yes let's let's get to it the ending so we're saying i don't know what the hell's going on on those pages still honestly i looked i looked at that three times in the last two days <laughs> i'm not sure well leading up to it it's sheila and abby struggling with a knife and sheila had the knife right yes yeah leading up to it yeah it looks like abby and sort of the ghost of Sheila is struggling with actual Yeah, but again, like, I'm not no. sure Sheila. that ghost actually exists. Oh, wait, in the lead up, yeah. In the lead up. Uh, and then, but then the splash screen of what we think is Abby dying shows Sheila, actual Sheila, in sort wait, of I an. Ne hmm? I never thought that was Abby dying. I thought maybe she was stabbing what's her face. Well, okay, look at it. Yeah, it's so Sheila. It's ambiguous. <laughs> They're both being stabbed, which that's not how that would work. Yeah, neither of them has a visible knife in their hands at that point. Mm -hmm. And like more tellingly, Sheila's hands are both visible without a knife in, their, in her hand. Yeah, okay. But Sheila is embracing Abby. Yep. Like of the two, Abby's the only one that seems to be in a kind of state of like shock or surprise. Like what? They're both hands... being stabbed. No. L look at the image. Catherine, they're not embracing. Look, Sheila, at, yes, look at Sheila's Sheila is, hands. She's like grabbing onto this lady. It's called a hug. No, it's not. <laughs> Ladies don't hug like that we unless we're fighting to bad. death. Ladies don't <laughs> hug. They've like been like slapping each other's backs repeatedly so that people don't think that they're okay. She's embracing <laughs> Abigail, and Abby is the one who's got both. Like, like she isn't. She, she's not able to balance in that. She's the one off balance. The one with her hands wide open her feet off the ground. And then, yeah, the knight who up until this point has been Abby in her imagination is stabbing both of them. Theoretically, and the, maybe. the gore from the dragon earlier on is coming out and there are gems, just like when she defeated the dragon, yep. the dragon's horde spilled out and they're on a trail of gore that leads back to ghost Sheila. The ghost. Yeah. It was sort of suddenly looking. has turned away and doesn't seem particularly interested. Well, I think right. is interested doesn't want to watch this. I don't think she is interested. She's just fixing her hair, like eh. Hmm. So yeah, I'm still not what entirely. Do you, sure what do you make of it? Idea. What really threw me off was realizing that you can see both of Sheila's hands, like until yeah. like because the gore kind of obscures her what her right hand. Her right hand. But like when you realize you could see both of Sheila's hands, it's like, I don't, I don't, what, what's happening? <laughs> I saw it as like, Abby sees herself as the knight who is stabbing them both. And you, you don't see Abby's hand. I feel like she got the knife and she's stabbing Sheila. And that's why Crystal's like, oh no, you killed another one of my parents. Well, Crystal doesn't know that her dad's dead at this point. <laughs> right. 
which is also Maybe. something. So you think I, it's it's so it's Abigail's imagination has killed both Sheila and basically the life that Abby's been trying to lead. Yeah. If you t- interpret it that as the normal and looking the Abby. Take, like, Abby is not actually being killed here, but like her conceptualization of this life she was building. The norm. Yeah. No one will ever think of her as that person anymore. She's the crazy woman who drowned her husband and stabbed. Stabbed her husband. The ex. Wife. Yeah. The ex-wife. Yeah, maybe. So the other so take cool. is that somehow they're just embracing <laughs> and like that's shattering Abby's like sense of. I, it's oh, a weird, like, I don't know I what don't Sheila's doing in that embracing. image. I don't think so either. But now that they I'm were just screaming it, like, like half a second ago, she was it's like, not a, it's still not, another, like, let's be friends. It's not a violent, like, they're not struggling in that picture. Yes, they are. Mm, okay. You don't, I don't think? I really it. think that they it's are. It's really possible that Abby has a knife in her hand and has stabbed Sheila and Sheila has fallen forward and just tried Sheila to Sheila is like, she's not back. hugged. She's like gripping. Like, look at those those lines. Her fingers are digging into Abby's back. It sure would be nice uh, to have oneself right now. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, just picture it. Doesn't look like a I violent I can zoom in and me. hang on. I've opened it in a separate window. I mean, I think either, like, I actually could be, I could be talked into either, which is unfortunate. I mean, there it is. It's ambiguous. Yeah, which I don't know. Like, I'm I'm coming around to liking this book's ambiguity, but like, Kat and I have been (laughs) talking about this on and off for like years at this point. And like, I'm, I grow lower on ambiguous endings, like each year, I feel like overall, like. I when they're done that. well, they're very good. If they're this not one, done well, they ain't very great. Cool. And it definitely like rewards going back to look at the story again in a different like and piece together all the connections and try to figure out what's happening. And like I think that really helped me figure out too, like in my mind at least, what the theme of the story is too, and puzzle out that to me there's not even a ghost. <laughs> like I don't think there's a ghost. Can I just say, Matt, I think we were opposite on this because I'm usually just like, yeah, ambiguous endings are the best. And Matt's like, ugh, no. And in this one, he was like, yeah, it works. And I was just like, this is unacceptable. Someone tell me what's going on. Because I feel like her her stuff is never this ambiguous. Like, I think it works a lot for this one, too, because part of the whole thing is like that people are kind of strangers to each other. And like, you Mm -hmm. can't ever really know entirely what a person is or what they're thinking or who they are. Even when you're like, they're literally married to each other. She knows nothing about this dude almost. Like, he doesn't, she doesn't even know like how his wife actually died. Like, well, she can't talk to him. He's a a man, yes. (laughs) Well, no, he's just like kind of scary. You know, like, she doesn't know what's going to happen. I don't know. So, like, not knowing how the book ends exactly feels like it works for this book particularly because it's so much about the ambiguity of not knowing what exactly has happened in a person's life so i'm i'm willing to let this one slide because it's good <laughs> is where i'm at <laughs> very often these days i just want a person to like tell the story have an ending like make it so that the thing is actually a story and i'm not doing as much of the work of trying to like figure out what happened and also then by proxy solving what the book is about. I think this one ends up working because it kind of is what the book is about. Or at least that's my take on it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, great. You're going to make me put so many images. (laughs) That has now sent an image of what a hug looks like for Kat, who has gone hugless her entire life, apparently. We never hug in this house. Never. So sad. Never. Only just a firm handshake. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, mean, I think it, I actually do kind of think it's possible it's a hug now. I hadn't really thought of that. I definitely thought she was just falling Wait, forward. Wait, hold up, hold up. <laughs> are, you, are you looking up pictures of a stabbing now? We're going to have to put that in the show notes, too. Oh. This, is, this is an image titled Pain. Look at those uh-huh. fingers. That's what it looks mm-hmm. like to me. God damn it, you guys. We have to save off so many... <laughs> images at the end of this recording pain <laughs> but yeah i don't know it definitely does seem like the night is more figuratively killing abby's sense of the life she was building for herself than actually killing abby that i think i'm in for for sure 
then it just mm. comes down to like did they finish their struggle and now they're talking it out <laughs> or did Abby stab this lady well crystal's not happy what she's seen so well, so I guess her, her mom, mom holding a dead woman <laughs> probably wouldn't. The woman it's just that she had been her mother. What happened. Which is fine. I think it works for this kind of story. The yeah. fight beforehand is drawn really well and like in such a way where like the actions are obscured too. Like the pacing is really frantic. Like it's panel, 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 panel. And, and you kind of feel like, like you're there and you can't see because it's like yeah, right up in your face. Yeah, jostled around and like you can't quite get a clear like look at like what's happening, which then again leads beautifully into this where it's like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't have enough information to figure this out. Yeah, because we get that one panel that Sheila is still holding the knife. In the next one, we don't know where the knife is. We can't see her hand anymore. Yeah, there is like at least a panel or two where you lose track of where the knife is and who has it, I believe. Again, don't have the book in front of me. But yeah, sure. and like, is there blood on that knife? I don't know. It's it's in grayscale. It could it just be black, swoosh yeah. in line. Swoosh in lines. Because they're like, stop! Or where she tries to say stop and then is cut off. Yeah. Where the ghost may or may not be holding her head. Like, there's, there's a splatter there, too. Yep. Yep. The contrast of the know. reds and purples and pinks to the, the grayscale of the normal, mundane, depressing, terrible world is also a very cool choice. Color is used really well throughout. Yeah, I do like yeah. when it snaps from her fantasy directly to reality and like the the landscape is the same. It just goes like a sharp yeah, cut from color just, to... Like, people are in the same poses and in the same positioning, but it goes from Knightsville to on the lake or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, those are cool ones. I noted those down too. All right. You guys have anything else you want to talk about with this book? Did we solve the entire murder board, Kat? Hmm. <laughs> I feel like I do understand it better. Or at least I've I've come to a narrative that makes sense to me. Yeah, and I did like I did two yesterday and like today helped also, but like I definitely feel less irate about it than I did the first time I read it. I, like, <laughs> yeah. I read the ending like three times in a row that night because I was like I gotta, I gotta figure out what the hell just happened in here. Like, is she talking to Abby or is she talking to Sheila? Is like, who is someone dead or who killed who? Like, what's going on? Like, mm-hmm. it I don't. And like, also, I feel like some of that stuff ended up not mattering as much to me too, as I picked at details of the other bits of the book. Also, so who is the guest in the house? <laughs> it's a ghost, maybe. Or maybe I say Abby considered maybe. herself to be. Yeah. Oh, maybe it's I Abby. I mean, if it is the ghost and the ghost is Abby's imaginings, then it's definitely <laughs> so. Well, I mean, yeah. the fact that she never considered herself to fit in as a housewife. Yeah. So she's as only a, a guest in the house. Yeah. Her own house. Because then they repeatedly say, oh, you haven't, it's your house. You should know what's in your attic. Oh my God, literally prompted me to go into my attic because <laughs> I was like, I'm in my <laughs> attic. So Wait a I went in my attic. There's a so help me if there's paintings fan. up there. There's a giant fan that doesn't work, a lot of like insulation stuff strewn about, and like three boards to walk on. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, that reminds me real quick of like, Sheila is effing unhinged. Because remember at the beginning of the book, Abby was all like, I just love putting things in their special places and putting my coffee mugs away. And then later she's like, did somebody move my coffee mugs around? Sheila's going in there and like rearranging stuff. I mean, she took a mug and left it on the dock. She left it on the dock. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't catch that, man. That's probably what was going on. (laughs) When she's swimming away. She's like making coffee in there or something. I don't know. It is unhinged <laughs> that she's just visiting her daughter. Before. Yeah, in the night, as as like, as like at a point where even if Crystal doesn't actually think it's a ghost, she's willing to say it's a ghost. Like, well, I think she doesn't want to explain to get her mother like she's seen yeah, her father and mother that. like fight each other, and she doesn't want to get into that. That page where Crystal's talking about, and this is another thing where like Abby's so unreliable and like doesn't understand what people are saying to her sometimes. Like she just doesn't have a good read on situations. Like she and Crystal are talking, and Crystal's like, she's like, "Oh, don't worry, we weren't fighting. It's fine. It wasn't about you." And like Crystal's like, "Yeah, it's I know." She's like, "Oh, you know, we weren't fighting." He's like, "No, you weren't fighting. Like he fights with me. Like he fought with my mommy." Doesn't that he? wasn't a fight. <laughs> <laughs> Things weren't broken. That wasn't a fight. Yeah, no. Good Any comic. Other business to solve. 
I think we solved it. We cracked the case. The last thing I wanted to talk about then, just because it's something uh-huh. that I know we did, we did solve it. It's just like this is something that came to mind as I was reading it because, like, Pat, for the podcast, we read a lot of things that are by like creative teams, like more than one person. Not always. Like, Cal oh. brought a couple other things that are um, like so, one person, but like, it's very cool to see someone who's basically got their hands on like every aspect of the book from like inks to colors to lettering to pacing to design of the book like even the opening crawl of this like really sets the mood like it's got a good title page sequence of like Mm -hmm. in the house like it it shows you what you're in for like right away so like it's very cool to see like a singular vision brought to the page like this i think there definitely is something more i don't know like comprehensive and designed about it in a way that some of the other books we read aren't was there a question there yeah, I what? I just wonder if you guys agree or not. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Wait, what was like, the question? Guys, I guess, like, do you guys see a difference in, I guess, quality is actually what I'm asking in, in like, this even between, like a, like, a saga or something where, like, it's two people and they're both very good, but, like, they're two people and they're working separately on the page, kind of. Like, it's a team versus, like, this is Emily Carroll from, like, Nuts to Bolts, like, <laughs> pen, pen to letters. Like, this is this is Emily Carroll all the way through, like, I mean, it's interesting when people, like, every artist has their own unique style, and it's nobody's is ever quite the same. So I would notice a difference if, like, I read something where Emily Carroll teamed up with someone else. Like, oh, yeah, it'd be different flavor. Kind of like Good Omens doesn't read like other Neil Gaiman stories because Terry Pratchett was in there being like, cheer up. This is glum. <laughs> makes this goofier. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So I don't think that you can weigh one against the other. I think they're just different. Yeah, it'd be it'd be hard for me to pinpoint like if there were more of an editorial, I don't know, filter for this, would it be any different? I don't know. Maybe. I do think it's hella more impressive to be able to do all the color, the writing, and the inking and the text by yourself. Yeah. There's so many different skills that go into that. <laughs> Like, there's so many, oh my god, there's so many comics that I've bought at, like, conventions where, like, it's a good comic and you're reading it and, like, the lettering just ruins it because the lettering's not good. Like, Mm. I bought one where the art is great and the story is just like, oh god, the artist wrote this and it's not (laughs) Yeah, that that has varying success for me also. (laughs) (laughs) Although, interestingly, you don't usually see the ones where... The, the writer's very good and the art isn't. Because I guess those never made it to print. Mm, or maybe like XKCD, like, I'm going to draw stick people. He's actually pretty good at art, though. I was going to yeah. say, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, it's very, like, it definitely feels like a singular vision and it's well executed in, like, every aspect. And I really enjoy it. I'm also mad that someone can be this good <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah, all right. That's going to do it for the actual discussion, I think. Do you guys have recommendations for people who like this book or are looking for something in the ballpark that they would also enjoy? Who wants to go first? Uh, I guess I can. Okay. I, I once again have recommendations that aren't of the same medium. That's fine. Pat. I'm going to jump to movies. Uh, while reading this, I really had a strong uh, comparisons to the film Crimson Peak. I don't know if either is that the one that with, with the Hansen. lady? Yeah. It's a ghost story with a very similar type of ghost. And it's got a similar, actually dripping red is very common. Because <laughs> they're at a house. One, actually, I'm looking it up. I should. saw like the first half of it. It's very reminiscent of this comic. So if you like the tones of this, it's not quite the same sexual identification trauma kind of stuff, but it's got a ghost. There's a twist. There's lots of dripping red stuff all over the place. And excellent costumes. Yeah. It's fun. Uh, And then another one where it's a fantastic world that you at the end, aren't sure if it's real or not. And you got to make that choice for yourself is pan's labyrinth. Oh, Where it's got very similar creepy imagery that this young girl escapes into to get away from the horrors of reality of World War II in Spain. Um, 
And yeah, that one has an ending where it could be really happy or it could be really sad. You get to, you get to decide. Two Guillermo del Toro films, eh? <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> cool. I didn't mean to rewatch Pan's Labyrinth also, okay. actually. Uh, mm. A quick note. I'm, I think Pan's Labyrinth is about the Spanish Civil War, not World War II. Uh, maybe. That was World War II. Maybe as well. It's been a while. All right, Catherine. <laughs> yeah, I think it's time for a rewatch of that one. I've been meaning to do that for a while. Okay, so my recommendations, I decided to stick to the comic medium, I suppose. Um, first, of course, Emily Carroll has other stuff out there that all has the same similar sort of like artistic vibe, spooky vibe, more psychological thriller sorts of things. Um, books and of course the website there's lots of stuff there one of the things on the website is actually a prequel story for a story that is featured in a later book that she does which is pretty cool um and then for web comics that again take pretty good um use of the flexibility that using the web for your comic provides uh laura olympus is a pretty good one it also has kind of a similar like colorful um scale very different content it's not a horror movie it's a it's a romance set um in the what if the greek gods were really colorful and they lived kind of like modern people do Um, but it's just really pretty and it's cool because i think this happens sometimes with web comics you can see the artist develop their skills as the thing goes on so you read the first couple and you're like well this is okay I can I can kind of get past the the shaky art, and then by the end it's like now you're just showing off. Come on. Um, <laughs> and then for horror comics, I suppose the the name that a lot of people seem to really like is Junji Ito. They're more of a manga style, um, and they are I I think they're kind of longer. Maybe short this ones. One. There's so, a bunch yeah, of there's some short it. ones. There's usually like a bunch of them in the same book when I find them. Like yeah, the ones stories. The ones I've read are a collection of stories, but they're all stories about the same theme. Like one of them is like spirals, and they're all just stories yeah. about creepy spiral. <laughs> yeah, you must have seen the one that's this hole was made for me. Like, oh, yeah. the pumpkin. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a Junji Ito. No, in the the side of the cliff face or whatever. <laughs> No, somebody did it as a jack o' lantern pumpkin. It's like a I'm meme sure or something did, yeah. now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so I've those not are read like them, but I know of them. Yeah. Black and white, not a great use of color, sort of thing. Well, I mean, obviously, it's not what he's designed it for. But if you're like, okay, I want to see pretty colors. <laughs> if you're in, if you're in it for the pretty colors, read Laura Olympus. If you're in it for the spooky, read Junji Ito. Or maybe just like swap a short story between. My recommendation is the Nice House on the Lake, by. James Tynion, Alvary, Alvaro, Martinez, Bruno, a bunch of other You didn't people. practice that name, did you? I didn't. I actually didn't. Wait, that was several at, names. I didn't look at it, though. So I think <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty good for not having okay. looked at the comic in like months. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call you out there. That's okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm the best Spanish speaker in the world, as we've established. I don't think James is a say. Spanish name. I said James correctly, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, Nice House on the Lake is a horror story. Um, it's got a similar vibe to this in that it's like much more of a creepy, psychological, unsettling horror. It actually, I hadn't even really thought about this yesterday when I was thinking about it, but like it also has a little bit of the theme of like, how well do you know the people around you? Because like the main instigator of the story is someone who's friends with like, all these people have been gathered at this nice house on the lake for the weekend. And then shit happens, like shit hits the fan um, from there. And like, it's got a very slow burn, like relationship driven between the characters kind of horror. So it kind of fits with this to me. Like it's telling more of a psychological story than a, again, like attack you in the face horror story. Um, It actually, I did flip through it like very quickly before we started the podcast. And I noticed it does a similar thing with the the title card page, like in the same way that this has the like slow, a guest in the house, like every chapter of nice house has the, the title like scrawl or whatever of nice house on the lake, like reflected on the water of the lake. So there's definitely Mm -hmm. similar sensibilities in there. The art's a bit different. There is some nice use of color. It's not like this though. Um, So like, it's not, 
artistically it's a little different but it definitely has the same vibes so cool. i think you would like it pat <laughs> take a look all right well guys thank you for doing this deep deep murder board discussion of a guest in the house as always, if you want to get in touch with Pat or myself, you can email us at waitingonthetrade at gmail.com. You can also find more comics-related goodness, including a semi-popular blog post about Emily Carroll's Through the Woods at mattreadscomics.com. Catherine, thank you. I feel like we should have done this forever ago, but this was a good book to do it with, so I guess we couldn't have done it till roughly now. Wow. Amazing. Perfect what ending a- right there. <laughs> 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 oh, thanks, guys. this was really fun i like again this was a story that i think merited like two or three reads so the podcast was a, a perfect way to discuss all our our clues and theories you can disassemble your murder board now yeah. i think all three or four that i brought up you too quickly said no that's not it so well you didn't read closely <laughs>